Watch this and other Frontline programs on PBS.org. Camden, New Jersey sits in the shadow of Philadelphia. It's a city that seems in a constant state of peril. Poverty here is rife. Unemployment is double the national average. Public institutions are in crisis, or like the local library, simply shuttered. It's officially one of America's most dangerous cities. But Camden may also be the city to help solve one of America's most intractable problems, lowering the cost of health care. As a doctor and writer for The New Yorker, I came here to meet the local physician who began to figure it out. It all started 10 years ago with a shooting. I was working in my house one evening, heard gunshots, then got a call from a neighbor. So I went running down the street. The police had gotten there already. So I ran up and said, you know, I'm a physician. Where's the victim? And, um, and they all sort of turned around and said, he's over there. What is the location? He was laying on his side, facing the back tire, and he had a pulse. He wasn't breathing, started rescue breathing. Eventually, his pulse stops. So I, I was just pretty overwhelmed by the whole thing and angry and... Uh, you were angry that they hadn't been even tending to the victim. You know, I said, why didn't you guys um, help him? And the police officer said, we didn't want to dislodge the bullet. I mean, it was just, just a complete blow off. And uh, I couldn't imagine how we could have reached the point in our society, in this city, where you would just leave a victim lying there in their own blood. He was a Rucker student, and he was close to graduating. You know, he was one of the, the wonder kids that make it out of urban communities. And here he was just about to make it out. Brenner's immediate response was to get involved in police reform. He thought if he could get a hold of crime statistics, he could map hotspots, the places where good policing would make a difference. But the department wasn't interested in helping a local doctor. So he went to another place, one he knew well, the hospital. There, buried in billing records from the ER where violent assaults get treated, he found crime patterns. As he crunched the hospital data, Brenner discovered something totally unexpected, other kinds of hotspots. It became clear that there were hotspots of, of everything. There were hotspots by disease, hotspots by, by patient. There were certain patients who'd been over and over and over going to the emergency room and hospital too much. There were hotspots by zip code and by neighborhood. And so you sit and begin to look through the data, and I'm looking at my patients who are in the data and realizing I had no idea how much healthcare cost. I had no idea how expensive it was, and it was just shocking. Brenner says the numbers showed that 1% of people living in Camden accounted for 30% of hospital charges, most of those racked up in the emergency room. So you're compiling all of this information coming from all of the hospitals in the local area. Compiling massive amounts of data, so a full year Brenner then turned that raw information into visual information. So this is a map of the city of Camden, and this is looking at cost data. So the red areas are high-cost hotspots. These are parts of the community where people who have more than a million dollars in payments to the hospitals live, and this is over a five-and-a-half-year period. So here you pulled out the two most expensive city blocks. Yep. But you found in your community there are two buildings that, That's right. that are the most expensive places. That's exactly right. So the, uh, the building on the bottom, Abigail House, is a nursing home. And the top one, Northgate 2, is an apartment tower with elderly and disabled people. $83 million in bills. That's right. It's probably more than the cost of the building. Yes. <laughs> yep. This being America, where we all demand the best that medicine can offer, you might assume that at least for the money, the residents were getting good care. But Brenner found the majority of the care for chronic diseases, from asthma to cancer to diabetes, was being done in the ER, not a good place to treat chronically ill patients. Treatment was not coordinated. Follow-ups were not part of the plan. It was really obvious in the data that the most expensive people were getting terrible care. 
and I knew them. So I'd walk in the exam room and say, Mrs. Rodriguez, I haven't seen you in three months. Where you've been? Well, I've been in the ICU for a month and a half. I've been in the hospital for another couple of weeks. And I'd say, well, what happened? And she'd say, well, I'm not really sure. A lot of doctors came in the room. They never really explained anything to me, but I've got this whole bag of medicine. So American healthcare doesn't do a good job taking care of sick people. The way we built our system is really a system that's very hard to access. It works well for the average patient, but if you are blind, if you're deaf, if you're disabled, if you're in a wheelchair, if you don't speak the language, if you're developmentally delayed, if you have a, a complex mix of illnesses with many providers involved, the whole system starts to break down. Brenner's big insight was to use his data to target the sickest and most expensive patients in the city. In 2007, supported by small grants from foundations, he put together his team of medical hotspotters. Hey, Anjanae, it's Kathy Jackson giving you a call from the coalition. I was wondering if you had a chance to do your blood glucose logs. Okay. The most visible part of the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers are these nurses social workers, and medical assistants. I think it's also important to show that he was really going all over the state. Yeah, wherever he Three years later, his team of troubleshooters has sought out and organized care for more than 300 people. You know, make sure we have transportation that's going to be able to accommodate a disability. When I visited, Kathy Jackson was making a house call to one of her most challenging patients, Derek. Do give me the briefing on Derek, because I haven't met him yet. So Derek's in his 30s, and um, he has seizure disorder. OK. Yeah. And um, then his other problem, which gets him in the hospital most of the time, is asthma. It's always an issue. He's always wheezing, and the house isn't, it's dirty, it's dusty, roaches, and all kinds of, all kinds of triggers. So we took a contractor there, and the contractor said that he really wouldn't want to be liable to fix it up because he's afraid it would actually, like, crumble. Hey, Derek, how you doing? Yeah. I'm, I'm Atul Gawande. I'm a doctor from Boston, but also a writer. Um, so, Derek, you have had a number of hospital stays and emergency room visits because of asthma, I hear. Right. What happens when you have your asthma attack? When um, I start wheezing, my lungs are actually, you know, it's like a rubber band. It just clo closes up, like, really tight. And it'll be hard for me to breathe. We think the house probably is part of it. There's a lot of dust with the mm -hmm. walls, the open walls, and... Would you mind, Derek, if I have Kathy just show me around the places in the house that she thinks might be contributing to your asthma? Yeah, sure. Okay. That'd be great. I'd just like to see for myself. Okay. Yeah. You want to lead the way, then? Before Kathy started working with him, Derek was in the emergency room 35 times over six months. Oh, yeah. Lots of mold here. I cannot help your asthma. <laughs> Kathy's work with Derek includes everything from inhalers to insurance to finding a contractor willing to rehab the house. Why don't we just say, Derek, fix your house. You've got this and that falling apart. Uh, his family probably lives on about $1,000 a month. So they're not really capable. They're barely um, able to make ends meet. Without the team, Derek didn't have enough help with another medical problem, epileptic seizures. What are all the crosses? No, that's, that's, that helps me, you know, in case if I have an epilepsy. How does that help you? No, I just start praying, that's all. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Wow. Have you had any seizures recently? No. How long has it been? A week, a month? A week. I feel more comfortable with Kathy Jackson than the doctors and nurses in the hospital. You know, I can tell Kathy my problems, you know, I'm wheezing and stuff like that. She checks me out, you know, um, hear my lungs, yep. you know what I mean, talk to me. Always, as always, you always have some wheezes, but you're moving pretty good air, so that's good. She's the one that keeps me out the hospital. We're going to come back in one month, June 13th at 11 o'clock. Okay. Under Kathy's care, over the last six months, Derek's ER visits have been reduced from 35 to just two. See ya. And Brenner thinks they can do even better. If he can get other people from around the city 
to think like hotspotters. We've formed this as really um, a way of beginning to think agency by agency, how we can pull together for the most challenging cases. Every month, the whole city comes together, frontline providers, social workers, and we do anonymous case discussions at the city level. Substance abuse initiative. So when someone like Derek shows up at one of the emergency rooms, they'll call us right away. Actually, in 2011, he had two hospitalizations, and um, none in April, and only one since May. And so how much has your team been able to lower the costs for this really expensive group of patients? So we've seen some preliminary results uh, of 40 to 50 percent reductions in visits uh, and cost. Uh, we're now 40 to 50 percent reduction in costs. In cost and visits. The savings are hard won, and it takes persistence. Mr. Harris, it's Kelly and Anna from the coalition. You can't completely alter people's life circumstances. We're not going to cure poverty. The question is, how can you take the current situation that a patient's in and improve it enough to make them a little bit healthier and, and lower their unnecessary ER and hospital use and make them have a more productive interaction with the healthcare system? Do you see anything? This idea of focusing on the sickest to lower costs for everyone seems to be working here in Camden. But there are hot spots in every community. What if you took this idea and put it in play across the country? It might just work, but there's a catch. How would the medical establishment react if suddenly their most expensive and lucrative patients started costing half of what they do now? As this kind of an experiment works, though, you're talking about dropping the number of hospital visits as a whole. Yes. You're talking about removing people from emergency rooms. Yes. They could have to shut down floors and beds. They're yes. not going to be with you on this, are they? This kind of work is a game changer, and this is a blockbuster video moment for America's hospitals. What do you mean by a blockbuster video moment? So uh, along comes Netflix, and there had to have been a moment when a young executive walked in and said, hey, they're starting to rent videos online, and Blockbuster said, nah, people like coming to the video store. We're not going to make any change. So uh, disruptive change comes along, and I think um, better care for sick people is disruptive change. We have inflated a capacity bubble in our country to um, do expensive, high-tech, hospital-based care. So what's your ultimate goal here? So I, I'd like Camden to be the first city in the country that bends the cost curve dramatically while improving quality. Because if the poorest city in the country can do it, it makes the rest of the country look silly.